Today what I am going to do is actually very different. Different in a sense, um, you will be seeing that in order to understand our physiology, our biology, and our health, we don't just depend on a particular uh, understanding of a particular system. That means if we think that we understand the biology of the host and forget about all other interacting uh, systems in the environment, then that is a mistake. And more and more, we are trying to understand that. Because instead of a reductionist approach, we are understanding this, that a holistic approach is much more robust and stronger to understand health as well as to maintain health. So from that perspective, we will see that there are many different evolution, or rather revolution happened in the area of uh, biological techniques. So I will give you initially, rather very quickly, an overview of various techniques that might be needed to understand this entire biology. And then using those, I will be presenting a particular work that we are doing utilizing the understanding of the host as well as the resident microbiome in our system. So with that background, these are the people from Deflorn and these are the people from Indian lab. This is our institute, newly built institute, without whom this work is not possible. So I acknowledge them at the beginning. And the hypothesis on which I work on a broader sense is basically this. We really are one of a kind in many ways. And that is how integrative biology or systems biology is what I'm going to talk about. Because lower cost technologies and advanced data crunching, that means the generation of the data and the processing of the data is actually very much important to understand our health. It's not only just the genomic. And genomic, the word itself tells you about the sequencing part. So there is much more actually beyond genomics, beyond sequencing. And this careful matching of your individual biology to your medical care is now being called personalized medicine. And that is very much important. So how is biology being done or should be done? So you have different parts of biology. At the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the developmental biology, at the physiology level. So you first decide what is your question. And how you want to test your hypothesis. Now initially it may sound very abstract and that is how I plan so that if you can understand that, okay, these are the steps philosophically, then later on we can see how we can actually put in our data to fit into this philosophy to understand the real world. So after this hypothesis testing, it actually generates lot of hypotheses. So basically we start with one hypothesis, it generates multiple hypotheses. And then we go back to square one to ask what is the question. So that means we start with a very broad question with a hypothesis, try to answer that or try to get an answer. And then we generate more questions. And with those more questions, we actually try to understand at different levels of our cellular processes because this is actually multi-level systems. Every, many things are happening at a given time point. We have to understand what is happening maybe for this process and maybe for this process at this particular moment. And these two may be very different. And how do we actually superimpose them and constitute the biology? That is how we try to understand biology. So basically, in a very broad, uh, way of defining it is that we profile at various way at the molecular level. And then after understanding that, we try to understand 
they are interactions. So we know information about DNA, we know the inf information about RNA, information about proteins, and then we try to understand if there are some interactions or crosstalk between them and what is the relationship. From those, then we try to understand various phenotypic relationship. And then once we know all this, we try to put them together using some topic called bioinformatics. So basically, there are different various nomenclatures. I will skip all those things. In some cases, you know what is target and what is your probe. So basically, what I will be trying to tell you that there are four different major topics that I will be covering. One is the transcriptomics, and these are all post-genomic technique. Epigenomics and metagenomics. Um, proteomics and all those details, I don't think we'll have time to cover much. So basically, what we do to understand transcription process, we have probes that targets the template on the DNA, which is being transcribed to give you the mRNA. And mRNA represents basically the pool of genes that are expressed under a condition at a given particular time. And then based on that, companies have developed, scientists have discovered various high throughput techniques. One of them is known as microarray chips, and one such thing is from Affymatrix, and later you will see from different companies. So what we try to do using this technology, if you have a normal sample, and a tumor sample from which you have collected your mRNA, which is basically representing the genes which are expressed or not expressed, you have arrays of probes that can actually match with the original sequence with maybe one sequence different. Suppose you know this is a DNA sequence that you want to test, and you have put 25 such sequences with some modifications and try to find out how this perfect match versus mismatch are different with some color codes. Now this is a little complex. There are easier stuff for that. Where you do, what you do from normal and tumor, you take two different RNA pool, coat them with different colors, and you make the ratio. And once you know the ratio, so once you know, then what you do, you try to find out how this ratio between your normal, which is your control, versus a test, which may be a tumor, or maybe tumor treated with some drugs, the samples from those patients, how do they actually corroborate? This is a correlational graph. And from that, then you can try to understand at what level of cell cycle, if it is a cancer-related studies, and what are the genes associated with it, and from there, you try to understand a particular pathways that may be actually causing those changes. So basically, you are trying to understand a stepwise process, how genes are expressed or not expressed for a particular conditions, and try to understand what could be the mechanism. And once we know the mechanism, then it becomes easier to target that, whatever has gone wrong, to rectify it. So these are the steps basically transcriptomics is trying to do, and there are various different species that has been done using this technology. But that is not too much important for this, and there are different companies which are actually producing all this commercially. And within this microarray, it is not only the transcription that we study, we have whole array of processes that we can do. It can detect microRNA, micro RNA arrays, it can do protein arrays, tissue arrays, and so on. So you can do many, many different things. The next thing is epigenomics. Since one thing to understand host following a particular condition is to understand transcription. Then also to understand translational products like proteins or the modified proteins the post-translational modif modifications, or even post-transcriptional modifications. But apart from that, apart from the sequence, apart from the expression, there is another thing very important, that is epigenomics. Epigenomics is telling you that some modifications, either at the DNA level or the proteins associated with the DNA, 
if there are some chemical modifications, suppose something is methylated, something is acetylated, something is phosphorylated, a phosphate group is binding, and that is actually making the change, although the sequence remains same of the DNA. So that is actually beyond the, your sequence, and people have developed various different methodology to understand that. And one of the latest technique is this genome-wide association studies. So what it does, suppose you have certain tissue cell type to understand the genetic variant for a disease. And your control regions are different parts of the genome. And there are target genes maybe at the protein level, maybe at the microRNA level, and or specific proteins. And because of all these, you may be seeing some intermediate effects at various different level leading to a particular disease, and these are all caused because of some environmental changes. So what you do, you take a particular tissue cell type and try to see in which region a particular protein is changed from its normal condition, and now once you know that, it becomes much simpler to find out or, or explore for an intervention, how you can actually undo that. And in order to do that, we require systematic understanding of genome function. That means at the level of enhancers, promoters, post-transcriptional control, microRNAs, and many things which are actually regulating the finally the gene expression. So in order to do that, this is a paper came a few years back in science that actually tried to do a 2.3 million regulatory elements across 127 tissue per cell types. So epigenomics can be so high throughput. And quite some time it happens in our study, we actually ignore epigenomics or epigenetics. Because it tries to give you the entire genetic steps, regulators, regions, motifs, target genes, so that intervention becomes very, very easy, not only to understand how a disease originates. And after understanding that, you can see here is a list of various diseases which are maybe the infectious disease, some are cancerous disease. You can try to find out what are the different cells or tissue types that are associated with a particular disease or what may be common across various diseases. So epigenomics is a very, very strong way of understanding. So it yields new insights on relevant tissues and pathways, enable linking non-coding elements to relevant target genes, and provide a mechanistic basis for developing therapeutics. So it's basically itself a very holistic approach. And so on, then once you know more about genes, you can do the genome-wide association studies to find out the linkages among various genomes or, or various genes to understand how is the trait heritability. So basically, it helps you to understand genetics very much at the deeper level. And then, after getting all these things you can understand, when you are bringing so much of high throughput, so much of data, what is false positive, what is false negative, to understand that, to identify that, to recognize that, is very, very important. And that is what is basically this particular statistical approach, a Bayesian approach, which is very different from the regular univariate analysis, which depends on the probabilistic uh, happening or occurrence of a particular incidence, tells you or differentiates a false positive from a real positive or true positive. Okay, this is a particular data. I am just um, leaving that. So you now know transcriptomics and epigenomics, two very strong tools. But what tools enable biological discoveries? Since this may be very good in understanding certain disease process and intervention, therapeutics, prophylactics, but biological discoveries are even more than that. It includes whatever I said, plus. 
this science channel of 100 greatest discoveries, this microorganisms which was first invented so long back, is actually came as one of the important discovery to understand our health and we all know why. And this is the microarray, just a representative, doesn't mean only the transcriptomics. So basically our job is to understand which tool to use when. One of the greatest technique of recent time is metagenomics, which is based on sequencing, but very high throughput sequencing. Microbial biomarkers, that metagenomics actually help us to understand, and the data mining. These are the three things which is very much important to understand metagenomics. So what is metagenomics? Some people say it's a total collection of microorganisms within a community. And there are papers suggesting that it's also microbial community or microbiota. And if we go further, it's the total genomic potential of a microbial community. You see, if you just follow how it is changing. And finally, you see, it is the total biomolecular repertoire of a microbial community. So it is not only confined within the sequence or the genome only. So this is basically all supported by various different publications. And this is what we are trying to understand. So basically, study of uncultured microorganisms from the environment, which can include humans or other living hosts, if we sum them up. You see, whatever we do in science, we try to sum up. Because at some point, biology was not being done that way. And now it is being done. And it is making it more interesting and challenging. So who's there and what are they doing? So what are those microbes? What do functional genomic data tell us about microbiomes? What can our microbiomes tell us about us? And using these various large data sets, how we can actually proceed to understand anything. So here is a study that dealt with 300 normal adults ages between 18 and 14, understanding 16S rRNA samples converted to DNA and the whole genome studies sequencing, five sites per 18 samples, blood, blood, oral cavities, the samples were collected from different parts and compared with reference genomes. And after doing all this, they found very interesting results, which actually talks about psoriasis, Crohn's, colitis, obesity, acne, and so many things. So many things have been already established using microbiome data. And how is it mainly done? This slide tells. Our first goal is to understand who is there, who are there. And in order to do that, a quick way is the 16S reads, the 16S rRNA, which is a particular gene, and you sequence it. There are nine hypervariable regions. Based on those hypervariable regions and the specificity, you can get some idea about the taxa, phylum, and family, and maybe genus. And then once you go that, or do that, you don't really get much information about the species level. You get some, but it may not be that reliable, because you have to understand, based on those sequencing data, whatever algorithm is present, they are actually all predictive in nature. Based on what is available out there, then they compare and try to predict, oh, this may be this particular species, which may not be at all. So you have to do now a whole genome sequencing for the entire population. Because not all of them are culturable. Most of them are not culturable. So you cannot depend on culture. So basically, when you do, and from this data, by comparing taxa and the orthologous clusters, pathways, and modules, you can try to understand what are the species available. And once you have all those species known, or many of them are known, not all. It is impossible because we don't have all the information about all of them. We try to understand a functional role. And this functional role can be done using a metatranscriptomic. Since anything related to those microbiome or microbes, we call it meta. Whereas for the host, minus meta. 
and all these pathways, how it is doing, we actually understand many of these things. And then in biology, it is very important to do validation. So we then bring knockout mice and many other things to understand. And based on this, there is a human microbial, microbiome project going on in the US. And I'm just skipping this uh, because all it is saying that you can do many things using this. I will tell you this particular thing, what is important, that people have already developed very, very nice and robust algorithm to find out how confident you could be on your data. And once you are done, there are this MinPath and other uh, databases, web-based databases, from which you can get the idea about the pathways. Of course, I know that I am telling many things. It may not be all going through very crystal clear, but at least if you know, okay, roughly, that this is the process, that would be good enough. So basically, I will show you this data where you can see by comparing some mutations, some survival data from the microbes and the gene expression by combining the transcriptomics or the proteomics, you can actually talk a lot about various things about the health. That is a biological discovery because we are trying to understand or trying to define what is health. And health is not very well defined. Actually, if, if somebody asks, what is health? How do we answer that? It's a very vague and undefined word. Domics. Ah. Health domics. Health domics, yes, <laughs> that's correct. So basically, microbiome and the host, understanding of this is helping us to define um, health. Then on top of that, there are SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphism, genotypes, and various di diseases um, that can be actually studied using these, correlated, and many, many things have been done. I'm just showing some of these uh, papers, which are landmark papers in this whole area. Um, we don't have to really go through all these things, except the thing. So basically what happens, biological story, that's what we are trying to generate. That gives you idea about intervention, that gives you idea about what are the samples, how we actually understand that, and it comes from the correlation studies of various different methodologies. And the final one on this particular side is this particular software developed by Nicola Segata is a very, very good database. If anybody is interested, please go through it. You will find out that how in this particular LEPC database, you can correlate various databases that are available. You know, unification of science, that's what we talk about. Physicists talk about that. Biologists were farther, far from that. Now physicists are coming to biologists to do biology because biology is probably on this universe the most complex system to understand. So, Basically then you have various ways of representations and understanding of health because it is a complex thing. It is not that um, just by doing one experiment or two experiments we will understand everything. That is the thing we should understand. And there are many other databases uh, that I have put in my slides. When I share the slides you will have all these so I don't think it is important. So basically what we are doing, gene function, gene to gene, data to function, function to function. These are our goals. Now, I just uh, uh, quickly go through this to come back. I don't know, something is... Uh, this is uh, just to communicate a few things that how finally biological information looks like. And you can see that we are going from a very simple level to very complex level and various different mathematical formulation is also developed. So that is how we actually say this is systems biology where after understanding some information, how we can predict about an unknown system. That is the power of systems biology. 
So it is much more than integrative biology. Integrative biology helps you to understand at a glance, but systems biology helps you to predict about unknown system. So that is all about techniques. So I will not talk about any more any techniques in today's talk, rather now is trying to understand some biology that we do. So what we actually thought to start with, because you know, um, it is very easy to say that okay, we'll be doing this, we'll be doing that, but resource is the most important thing. Since in order to do any of these techniques, you need very expensive equipment, reagents, manpower, so resources, it's very resource uh, oriented uh, biology. So even if you want, you may not be able to do one thing. You have to have collaboration with other labs, different labs where you complement each other. So for an institute like ours, which is a very new institute, when I first moved in 2009, we started thinking what to do because there was nothing. And at the same time we have to teach, so my question started around this. Other day I said about psychological stress, I'm not bringing that. This is immune stimulators. That means some agents are there, which may be small peptides, which may be intrinsic, which may be extrinsic, coming from external source, which may be probiotics, and many other things. If we take any of these immune stimulators or immune modulators or different combination of them, how our host is actually behaving to that? Can we do something that if we know that host physiology is perturbed, using some of these immune modulators or immune stimulators, can we actually restore them? So based on those questions, we started some in vitro and in vivo studies. And I will be today mostly concentrating on this probiotics and the microbiome, not on the cationic peptides. So basically the hypothesis was, if select host defense peptides and probiotics may prime the host, innate mucosal immunity, that is my niche, sufficiently to combat bacterial challenge. So starting with a very simple question. And you will see some places the HDPs, ignore that, it will be mostly on the probiotics, followed by this microbiome. So what we started, a probiotics in vitro work, this is not with Lactobacillus bulgaricus, this is with two other strains which have been selected from five other strains. We started with five probiotics which are prescribed medically very widely. And out of those, finally we found this LA and BC Lactobacillus acidophilus and Bacillus classi, this is of soil origin and this you know it resides in our body. We selected those and started working on that and this is just showing in an in vitro murine macrophage cells how the survivals are. And once we find out the survival then our natural in, uh, instinct is to understand if there are certain innate immune genes which may be some pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory genes, how are they regulated at different dosage and at different time points. So basically what we try to establish, if the bacteria that we are using are toxic, up to what MOI level we can go, and when we decide, okay, this is the MOI level and this is the time of interaction or the treatment, then what is happening to the cells at different dosage? And this is what we are trying to see. So from the survival and from these initial studies, then we decide on the dosage. And then at that dose, we follow the study. So from the previous studies, we decided 100 MOI, multiplicity of infection, so that if you have one host cell, you have 100 bacteria. And then we calculate that even if you give 100 bacteria to one host in that ratio, how many bacteria effectively are inside the host cell? And we find although MOI may be 100, effective MOI, 
which we define by the number of bacteria per cell inside, entered or strongly adhered, comes around maybe MOI of 1. And when you do MOI of 1, effective MOI may be close to very 0, very small number. So that's why, although it may seem that you are giving too many bacteria, but very few bacteria could go inside. So basically what we observed here, that with this treatment, that initial time points are not that very important, but later time points are very much important. And these probiotics are very different from this red line, because that is a pathogen, Salmonella typhimurium, ST. So basically we are trying to tell that these bacteria are different from a pathogenic bacteria. That's all, one step at a time. Then we try to understand how many of them are inside and what is happening. So we did some fax analysis, we did some confocal microscopy, and then try to find out the effective MOI here. And this shows that whatever different methodologies you use, we got the similar results. Whether it is a lysis or confocal or fax, we find out the similar studies. Now we understand this is a good MOI to work with in vitro. And then we try to understand how this macrophage gene expression kinetics following the treatment with this bacteria. That means we try to understand the mechanism, how things are happening. And this shows basically different number of genes which are upregulated or downregulated at different time point of interaction at a particular MOI of 100. And these are some of the protein level confirmation using ELISA of various different uh, genes following the treatment with lactobacillus and bacillus clausi. So we understand the mechanism in vitro level. We know the effective MOI. Now it is time to see if really these probiotics are effective clearing any infection. So we tried various different combinations. Suppose bacillus clausi alone, or lactobacillus alone, or 50-50, 30-70, 70-30, and so on. So I'm showing some of the data where it is showing that, say for example, BC 50-50, this is the controlled, and this is basically with the salmonella treatment. You can see that BC LA 50-50 ratio is the best, but it is not that great in in vitro. So in summary, what we found that when you grow these host cells and treat them following the challenge, you can find that in some cases, NF-kappa B pathway, which is pro-inflammatory pathway, or TNF-alpha pathway, which is pro-apoptotic pathways, are happening with maybe bacillus clausi treatment following the ST challenge, whereas with the LA treatment, it is actually very controlled inflammation. Some calcium signaling pathways are up, which is reducing the apoptosis, so it is actually giving you a very good information. Okay, fine, we have now done the in vitro study, now it is time to move to the in vivo. For in vivo, I will just give you first one liner. We use two different mice. And why did we do two different mice? because this is my mouse is Th2 biased. This mouse is Th1 biased. They are immunologically differentially biased. We want to see when we give the probiotic, if they differ differently. And before that, we compared bulb C and C57, Th2, Th1. That they significantly differ in their gut microbiota composition. This is basically what we have done using a 16S rRNA. And what you can find out that bulb C, you can see here, say at the phylum level, which is telling pharmacutes, bacteroid, say this is bulb C. Almost 80% to 85% is pharmacutes. Whereas around 50% is pharmacutes, 50% roughly is around bacteroids. So that means C57 and bulb C this Th2 and Th1 bias may have something to do with this, and it has. 
but it is not established. And then we try to understand at different level up to genus, what are the different things that is actually differentiating bulb C and C57 and you can immediately see from these color codes some of these things are very different. So basically bulb C microbiota composed of more formicutes and diversity of genera is higher whereas C57 the Th1 type microbiota has more bacteroids and genera diversity is less compared to bulb C. These are some of the abundance data which you just saw in the graphical format and before going to the real experiment I must also tell you if you do the analysis of the host gene expression from different organs of this bulb C and C57 BL6 the white and the black mice you will find actually lot of Th2 type genes are upregulated in bulb C which are downregulated in Th1 or C57 and vice versa. So let me just explain this in vivo study. What we have done, this, this is the same similar study we have done for bulb C and C57. So this is a day 0. Day 0 is defined as that we challenge the mice with Salmonella typhimurium plus a treatment of either LA or BC. So it is actually together. And then followed by a booster dose of the probiotic. That is day one. And then we start following their survival as well as the microbiome profiling and various tissue collection for various host responses understanding and serum collection to do the metabolomics. Now this part is not yet done so there won't be much data here but these parts are done so you will see this. So what is happening here treatment conditions is N means the number so NT means untreated, ST means Salmonella typhimurium, STLA means Salmonella typhimurium plus Lactobacillus acidophilus, STBC means ST plus Bacillus glossy, LA alone and BC alone. So you have all the different controls and the test samples. And when we try to do that, so we also uh, define that our ST that we are doing or the LA or BC, they are pure. And first thing we try to see the colonization. After we give the lactobacillus or the bacillus glossy, in which part of the colon they are actually going or which part of the small intestine they are going. So we have compared their colonization in the duodenum, jejunum, ileum and the colon. What we could find out here that in the ileum portion and the colon portions this is actually much more depending on a different dosage. And this is another interesting thing you can see when for the lactobacillus we can go a dose very high. For bacillus glossy we cannot go that high dosage because it is giving some kind of flatulence and bloating. Now these two are the survival data bulb C and the C57. What we observe here so this is the control data that is with the untreated. The mice are alive they are unchallenged untreated. When you have given LA alone this is also the survival. When you have given ST along with LA this is also the data. When you have given NT that means untreated BC alone the similar so no change but STBC that means Salmonella typhimurium challenged and treated with Bacillus glossy you have significant mortality and when it is Salmonella typhimurium alone challenged you have the mortality 100 percent on day 6. When we come back to C57 it is slightly different. What we are observing here NT and NTBC that means BC treated and untreated they are very similar no mortality. Whereas here LA alone and the STLA together there is some slight 
mortality, around 10% mortality we observe in C57. So C57 LA treatment is not as great as we observe in a TH2 system. Actually, our common sense will tell otherwise. Whereas BC is worse compared to this. Here we had around 20% mortality. Here we see almost 90% mortality. And ST also killed them one day prior. So basically a TH1 biased animal which has all the machinery to clear infection, we are seeing that when they are treated with probiotics, actually the TH1 efficiency is compromised. So lesson to be learned. And I skip the histology part. Microbiota perturbation. So for all those dates, day three, day five, we actually now compare. So D3 NT means day three untreated. Day three Salmonella typhimurium, STLA day three, STBC day three, LA alone, BC alone day three. So you could see from an untreated when you actually challenge with Salmonella typhimurium, how some of these things, this is this Morella, a particular taxa is very much affected. And when you have STLA, you could see this lacnospericia is increasing. Now, this is very interesting data in a sense because we don't understand many of these things yet, why it is changing this way or that way. That is further studies are needed. So basically if you compare say LA alone and the NT treated, they are very similar in a bulb C. And when you go the, for the C57, you see it is very different. The color codes are saying you right away even if you don't look at this. So basically what happens here, day 3 LA and day 3 NT are very different for C57. So you can see very easily LA treatment alone, I'm just talking about LA here, that is true for all this. It is modulating the microbiome. The probiotic is modulating the microbiome because this is the original microbiome for C57 and bulb C and here followed by a LA treatment, it is very different. And if you see now, BC is very similar to that NT. And if you remember that BC alone treatment was better in C57 than, LA, uh, than bulb C. So there are some correlative indications are coming out from this microbiome data and we are actually digging further. And not only that, this is day three. If you come to day five, it's very different. And for day five, if you see that day five LA is actually different from NT, and not only that, it is very much different from ST and this particular taxa, which we have now confirmed with some of the bacteria uh, using PCR for those specific bacteria, we found they are more opportunistic pathogens. So ST is actually promoting most opportunistic, more opportunistic pathogens, whereas LA is actually trying to reduce that. BC alone in bulb C is trying to increase that. So not all probiotic could be, it is telling, this is just two representative probiotics, this data should be done with all probiotics by various groups that different probiotics are different, it depends on your immune bias, health status and many different things. So we should not be just having probiotics. Uh, I mean, uh, no offense to anybody here, but without knowing much, we should refrain from taking this because depending on my system, I should decide what to do. These are some of the specific bacteria that we have picked from the species dependent analysis further, that the idea first came from the whole genome, metagenome, and then we did individual PCR of these particular strains. And what we found, these are the fold changes with respect to time matched untreated mice. What you could find 
that say for example, this particular bacteria from the name you can tell these actually metabolize butyric acid, a short chain fatty acid which is very much needed for our metabolic uh, healthy metabolism. And what it is doing in the STLA it is 2.6 fold higher than the NT and on day 3, day 5 it is 6 fold higher. Whereas when in the STBC it is actually very different on the day 3 it was negative that means it was down less than NT and it is 3 fold higher on day 5. So that is why we can see some protection maybe. So this is how what happens now if we do a metatranscriptomic analysis of the bacterial profile we would be knowing the pathways through which this bacteria population which is differential bacterial population is actually trying to protect us. Similarly you can see this Clostridium syndens. This is actually functionally opposite to Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile which you know for the IBD and things like that. This is actually very different. This you can see day 3 STLA was 1.7, day 5 STLA it is close to 16, uh, it is over 16 fold. That means whereas for the BC treatment they are not there, very similar to NT. So LA is actually modulating microbiome and we are getting specific bacterial species and there may be many more. This is just a few that we have done. And there are many other Clostridium species, not all of them are very well characterized. You could see for day 5 STLA, they are all very high. So that means LA is modulating some of the species so heavily compared to an untreated and compared to BC treated followed by ST treatment that you are actually expecting that probiotic can do if it is the right probiotic. Yesterday I showed about this other probiotic from Daflone that it is doing a fantastic thing and now what we are seeing this another lactobacillus acidophilus and what we found also so recently we published a paper on this not this data is it is not yet published. Uh, what we actually established reviewers asked how do you know this is a probiotic? We said no we do not know. We are claiming that this is a potential probiotic. So many of the strains are actually utilized or used in the market prescribed by the doctors and pharmacists, nutritionists as a probiotic strain. They are not actually established probiotics since no work has been done. We just assume they are probiotic. So we are actually helping through this kind of study not only understanding the health, not only understanding the role of microbiome, but also defining probiotics whether this strain of bacteria is a probiotic or not because you know not all lactobacillus acidophilus are probiotic or potential probiotics. Maybe one or two strains because the probiotics are strain specific. Similarly here in the C57 another group of uh, bacteria we have um, analyzed. I will not bore you further going through all this data since the bottom line is we found some very characteristic feature of lactobacillus acidophilus and why we know now and how that needs to be done for the studies. Basically what it is showing that LA can protect better a Th2 biased mouse compared to a Th1 biased mouse. So far we have not found anything or nobody has done any study to see or show that if there is a probiotic that would help Th1 type of animals. Now whether that is true for human beings we really do not know because not much study has been done in this area. And again now what we do so far it was from the microbiome point of view then again we try to understand the host response so that we bring the host response at different conditions. So these are the different conditions for bulb CC57, day 3 LA, day 3 ST, day 3 STLA all those different permutations are possible, we analyze them, we find out what are the genes, some of those genes are validated using a secondary methodology and then we found what are the important genes expressed in bulb C after 3 days of treatment, 
after five days of treatment, and what are their changes, why certain genes are actually high or some are very low. Similarly for uh, bulb C after five days, C57 after three days, so all sorts of analysis you have to do. So we are basically generating lots of data and then trying to put them together. How do we put them together? That is actually more important. And then histology, immunohistochemistry, all these different things to correlate, not going through all these. Rather, I would show you this. So this is a summary of C57 BL6 response to LA and BC. It is showing very similar to our uh, raw cells, the murine macrophages that inflammation and apoptosis are high. So that means whatever the modulation we are doing, it's not actually helping. Following a challenge when we have given the bacteria or without challenge when we have given the bacteria, LA and BC, they are not really doing that great. Whereas with LA, slightly better, but when we move to the bulb C, it is way better. We see the entire TGF beta pathway for the LA treated anti-inflammation, reduced apoptosis, controlled inflammation, and various different pathways we find out that LA is doing. So now what we are trying to see, you see you have the response from the host side, you have the response or the effect from the microbiome side with some agents that can perturb or modulate this environment. And now you try to correlate them that if this bacteria or the microbe in the microbiome is changed, how the host should respond, that part is also very clear. With that, I'm not going to show many different pathways we have here. Um, these are the people actually who helped me since Canada now to develop and generate various kinds of data and understanding. And with that, thank you very much.